to be together with you on this Reformation Sunday. This is a special day for us as a church, Prince of Peace, one on which we honor and remember the faith that has been handed down from the generations that have come before. The part of God's story that is our companion today features King David and God's reminder that God's love isn't contained in the physical buildings we create for worship, but rather the spiritual houses we embody within our very selves. King David's story, of course, points us toward the heirs of David that ultimately usher in God's very self in the person of Jesus who is to follow. It was the teachings of this Jesus and his disciples that inspired Martin Luther to renew a church and help it to help it find its way home once more. It's fitting that on this Reformation Day, this church now celebrates with four young people and their families as they affirm their baptisms in the rite of confirmation. This baptismal faith that we celebrate today is the same faith that has carried God's people throughout all the generations. This is the same faith that makes its home in our very selves. And this is the same faith that sends us back into the world to share God's love as far and as widely as we are able. As we begin, I invite you to light a candle and to have your communion elements at the ready. Let the flames remind you of God's presence wherever you may be this day. And may the meal that we will share unite our community of faith while nourishing us to continue God's work in the world. In 1521, Martin Luther, Roman Catholic monk, priest, and theologian, was called before the leaders of the church and state to renounce his teachings of the Bible. Luther's response was one of the pivotal moments in European history. Luther said, Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Here is what Luther taught based on scripture. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here, Here we stand. stand. God, God help, help us. us. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This, this is, is most, most certainly, certainly true. true. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Here, Here we stand. stand. God, God help us. us. You have been saved by grace through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. This, this is, is most, most certainly true. true. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together our gathering hymn, A Mighty Fortress, ELW number 504.
Good morning. It is time for the children's message, and I invite all of you to gather around. We have just sung a song called A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. Do you know what fortress means? Fortress sounds a lot like fort, and that's partly correct. This week we had so much snow that you could have built a snow fort. When I think of fortress, I think castle. And when I think of castle, I think of the Fisher Price castle that I had growing up and my sister and I would play with. And it had tall towers and a moat with a bridge and a dungeon that people would fall down into. It's kind of fun to imagine God as a king living in a castle with princes and princesses and knights in shining armor riding on beautiful horses. But wait, this song is not called Our God Lives in a Mighty Castle. No, it's a mighty castle or fortress is our God. Now that's confusing. It is Reformation Sunday, and that is the day we look back to the work of Martin Luther. He lived 500 years ago, but fortunately, I have my friend Martin Luther, the bobblehead, here with us today. Martin, the name Luther sounds fairly familiar. Is that like Lutheran Church? Oh, yes, it is. And you wrote this song called, A Mighty Fortress Is Our God? Yes. Why is God a castle? Is it because God is big enough to encompass all of us with his love? Oh, so it's not just an earthly castle. Ah, that makes more sense. Now, I understand that you lived in a castle for a couple years. Is that right? Was it exciting and glamorous and people had crowns on their heads and there were princesses and princes and kings and queens? Not really? Was it a big old stone building that was cold in the winter and kind of lonely? Yes. You are holding a book. I think that's the Bible. Yes, it is. I heard that during that time in the castle, you took the Bible, which was in Latin. I don't read Latin. I don't know if anybody else here today watching this reads Latin. But because it's important that people be able to read the Bible in their own language, you translated the Bible. The whole Bible, that's a huge project. And now we can read for ourselves about what God says to us about God's love and putting God at the center of things. Thank you for doing that. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for being present in our lives for being at the center of things. Help us to focus on you and what you have done for us, how your love comes to us as a gift that we call grace, this undeserved love of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now we are going to hear a prayer and a reading done by our ninth grade confirmation students, and it is about King David. King David lived in a fancy palace that he called a house of cedar. I would like you to listen to the story. God of hope, you promised to make David's household great among the nations. Then you sent your son, Jesus, to transform this world so that all people are one and one greater in your household. <laughs> Show us how to live as your children, as sisters and brothers in your holy and blessed realm. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who will one day welcome us all. Amen. Today we read a story about King David from 2 Samuel chapter 7. We read from the Message Bible beginning at verse 1. Before long, King David made himself at home 
and God gave him peace from all his enemies. Then one day, King David said to Nathan the prophet, Look at this, here I am, comfortable in the luxurious house of cedar, and the chest of God sits in a plain tent. Whatever is on your heart, go and do it. God is with you. But that night, the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is God's word on the matter. You're going to build a house for me to live in? Why haven't I lived in a house from the time I bought the children of Israel up from Egypt till now? All that time I've moved about with nothing but a tent. And in all my travels with Israel, did I ever say to any of the leaders I commanded to the shepherd Israel, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? So here is what you are to tell my servant David. The God of the angel armies has this word for you. I took you from the pasture, tagged you along after sheep, and made you my prince over my people Israel. I was with you everywhere you went, and mowed your enemies down before you. Now I'm making you famous to be ranked with the great names on earth, and I'm going to set aside a place for my people Israel and plant them there so they'll have their own home and not be knocked around anymore. Nor will evil, evil men afflict you as they always have. Even during the day I set judges over my people Israel. Finally, I'm going to give you peace from all your enemies. Furthermore, God has this message for you. God himself will build you a house. When life is complete and you're buried with your ancestors, then I'll raise up your child, your own flesh and blood, to succeed you, and I'll firmly establish his rule will build a house to honor me, and I will guarantee his kingdom's rule from me. I'll have a father, I'll be a father to him, and he'll be a son to me. When he does wrong, I'll discipline him in the usual ways, the pitfalls and the obstacles of this mortal who preceded you, and whom I will certainly dig remove. Your family and your kingdom are per permanently secured. I'm keeping an eye on them, and your royal throne will always be the rock solid. Nathan gave David a complete and accurate account of everything he heard and saw in the vision. Word of God. Word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Only during covid is an expression that we hear quite frequently these days. Maybe you've said it just recently. Earlier this week, before it snowed, if you can remember back that far in time, a friend of mine said that she is not ready to be done with meeting people on an outdoor patio for conversation. So she and a friend got together. They both brought their own sleeping bags to snuggle up inside. And just recently, the Star Tribune ran a story about the 10 best outdoor dining opportunities for fall and winter in Minnesota. I hear that heat lamps and campfire rings are in very short supply these days. We have been struggling with this being indoors versus outdoors because of the pandemic, knowing it is not safe to gather in large groups indoors. That dilemma about indoors versus outdoors is the same thing they were struggling with in our story for today. You see, David had become the king. He had moved the capital to Jerusalem, and he now lived in a spacious palace that he refers to as a house of cedar. But he struggled with the fact that he lived in this beautiful house while God resided in a tent. So he decided to solve this problem by building God a lavish house. But God had other ideas. Fast forward to the 1500s and the Reformation. Building God a house was again a major issue. 
you see the Pope wanted to build a great big grand St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. And to pay for it, they invented the very best fundraising strategy in history. It was called indulgences. And people could buy indulgences so that the soul of their loved ones would spend less time in hell or purgatory and not burn in hell forever. Now, who wouldn't buy these indulgences? But they were being sold to people who were so poor they could barely clothe and feed their families. And yet they were told they needed to buy these things. Martin Luther and the other reformers of his time saw the problem with this, that the church had gotten off track, that it was more about human needs and less about being centered on God. Our struggle now, as we are in our eighth month of the worst pandemic in a hundred years, is that we struggle with what does it mean to be the church when we are not gathering each week here in this beautiful sanctuary, coming together to pray and to sing and to hear God's word. We don't feel like we're anchored any place. We know that the church isn't a building. It is about God's people. But still, it's hard not to be together. The story of David can provide us some solace. You see, David wanted to build God this house, but God said no. In fact, God said to David, I will build you a house. God was content being in a tent among the people, this God who traveled with the people ever since they were freed from slavery in Egypt. God went with them and to them. God could not be contained in a box. Now this is good news. As we saw the tents of homeless people going up in parks and along parkways this summer, we can be assured that God was there with them. Just like God is in our homes with each of us and in the outdoors when we're out hiking or when we're gathered in the parking lot worshiping together. Now, temples and cathedrals and churches aren't necessary for God, but they are important to us as humans. They're an important part of our faith because they help ground us. We have a place to gather, a place where we remember who God is and how he is at the center of our lives. We sing, we pray, we hear God's word. We feel like we are part of something bigger than ourselves. The same is true for the rituals that we practice together. And yet the building is not necessary for God's sake. God is agile and nimble and moves around, coming to us. God is not contained here in a locked church building that we are barely using, except as a recording studio. This is good news, but it is hard to hear. Today, as part of this service, we will be having one of those important rituals in our faith journey the rite of affirmation of baptism, or confirmation. This particular class of ninth graders has shown great resiliency during this time. They started confirmation, like all of us probably did, by coming to classes at the church building. When they were in seventh grade, we studied the Bible, the overarching narrative of God's story and how we fit into that story and we made our learning hands-on. At Easter, for example, we made a paper mache tomb that we used in worship as a reminder of how Jesus was not there. Jesus is risen and out in the world. And at the end of the year, we painted Bible stories on ceiling tiles, each picking our favorite. And these combined with 
pictures done by people of all ages in the congregation are out in the narthex telling God's story in a tangible way. During eighth grade, we studied the small catechism and Martin Luther and what it means to be a Lutheran Christian. We talked a lot about loving our neighbors. And we were not just contained to the church building. We were out in the world. For example, we sorted funny shaped potatoes at second harvest and then had a conversation about what is daily bread? The daily bread we talk about in the Lord's Prayer. And I asked the question, are potatoes daily bread? And the students looked at me and said, no, of course not, they're potatoes. But as we talked about how daily bread means God meeting all of our basic needs, they concluded that yes, the potatoes are daily bread. We also looked at the needs and struggles of our neighbors through a poverty simulation that was designed by Habitat for Humanity and looked at how people have to make choices between paying rent or utilities or putting food on the table and how nobody should have to make those choices. When we were at the fall retreat last year, the confirmation students were studying the Ten Commandments and they did skits and a game show to teach the Ten Commandments. We figured out that the first three commandments are loving God and the last seven are about loving our neighbors. And the way we respond to God's love is to love our neighbors. So that is the main theme of the Ten Commandments. Now this class was the first to do confirmation class on Zoom and then to use our outdoor classroom. Outdoor classroom really means any place where we gather and put our lawn chairs in a circle. We were nimble and agile and moved around just like God in that tent. And then this fall, we had to be creative and flexible and came up with a way to do confirmation with the congregation at one of our outdoor park and pray services in the middle of September. This way, many of you were able to gather and celebrate with these students and their families on this faith milestone. Usually, confirmation is held in a building, often on Reformation Sunday. But fortunately, we were blessed with great weather on that September evening, a little different than the weather this week. We didn't lose any of the meaning of confirmation by not doing it in a building. Now David wanted to build God a house and God said no, but God recognized that humans need shelter and stability. The word house in this story has multiple meanings. Yes, it is about physical buildings that provide shelter, but it is also bigger than that. How God is the rock, the stability that we rely on. That God's love is big enough to encompass all of us. God promises to build us houses to meet our basic needs. And we respond by loving our neighbors. Sometimes that is very tangible. This congregation has a long history of serving through Habitat for Humanity and the group Holy Hammers, building physical houses. Our affordable housing team has been wrestling with the question, how is God calling us to meet the needs of our neighbors who do not have stable housing? And what is it like to wonder where you are going to sleep at night? Today, during our adult ed time, you can join the affordable housing team as we wrestle with these questions. And are we called to do something to love our neighbors in this way? Now, just like David found, sometimes we have plans and yet God has different plans in mind. This past summer, the high school students were planning to go on a mission trip to Appalachia to work on houses for low income people. But with the pandemic, this did not become feasible. So we canceled the trip and were disappointed.
But then an opportunity came to work on a house in North Minneapolis for a woman who had been recently widowed. Her house built in the early 1900s had had to have all of its wiring replaced and that took all of her savings. And so we as volunteers in partnership with other volunteers came in and put in new windows and painted and built new front steps so that her house would be warmer and safe for her to live in through cold weather like this. She was amazed that these strangers would come and do this for her. We got to know her and her story and see her tears of gratitude, how she felt that this was God's grace, God in action. And we got to see what it meant for God to say, I will build you a house and I will always be with you. Amen. This song is called Out of Hiding. It's by Stephanie Gretzinger. The first time that I heard this song, it was part of, of a dance production put on by Prairie School of Dance, which is a Christian-based studio. The story was about a high school girl who was being faced with all of the craziness of high school and the choice to follow Jesus. This song is Jesus speaking to that girl. Today, I hope as you hear it, you understand that it is also Jesus speaking to you. Come out of hiding, you're safe here. Oh, 
well, in the story of faith that God calls us into, uh, there are points along this journey that God has set us on that begins with baptism. And to this evening, we get a chance to take another step together. As a community of faith, we get to walk with four of our young people as they move along their baptismal journey. Tonight, they'll be affirming their baptisms. That's what we call the rite of confirmation. So at this time, to get it, give us a chance to get organized here, I'm going to invite uh, our four confirmads to come forward with their families uh, to come and stand with them uh, on their spots. They, they know where their exes are. So parents, Brothers and sisters, sponsors, if you want your grandparents with you, you can have them there. Eight. And now you'll see that Corey, who's been walking with you as well, she's weaving uh, around you a red ribbon. The color red uh, is our liturgical color uh, for uh, to remind us of the times when the Holy Spirit is present in our lives and a part of who we are uh, and comes to us. God comes to us in the form of the Spirit, and that Spirit comes to us on, uh, in, on Pentecost uh, when we remember the event of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came uh, and uh, like, uh oh <laughs> we need to give up a little bit of uh, slack on that end, I guess. We didn't measure out our ribbon very much, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll weave that back in and around through and, and know that uh, this community uh, is the presence of the Holy Spirit, that all of us gathered here together, we are embodying God's presence in and amongst us. And this red ribbon signifies uh, in a simple way that God's spirit is woven in and amongst our lives. And, uh, and so uh, know and trust that God is here with us at this moment. As you remember and affirm your baptisms, as this community of faith confesses its, its faith together, and, uh, and, uh, and you take this next step in your journey. So let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you for these four sisters whom you have made your own by water and the word in baptism. You have called them to yourself, enlightened them with the gifts of your spirit, and nourished them in the community of faith. Uphold now your servants in the, in the gifts and promises of baptism, and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask the, the uh, families to turn and face up towards the front here a little bit. Gaze upon the cross. <laughs> I ask you to profess now your faith in Christ Jesus, to reject sin and confess the faith of the church. And this whole gathered assembly, you will support these young people as we together recite in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which has three parts. And there'll be a little pause between each of the parts. Remember your own confirmations as well. Now, I ask all of you tonight, gathered here, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now, you will... 
dear sisters in the faith standing before us tonight, you have made public profession of your faith. Do you continue to live in the covenant of, that God made with you in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Allison Lee Zimmerman. <laughs> Lucy Jane Rawitzer. Taruni. Kaylin Sadanayaka. I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. Tegan Linnea Wetland. I do, and I ask God to help me. Now, people of God, I do you promise to support these sisters and pray for them in their life in Christ? If so, you say we do, and we ask God to help us. We do, and we ask God to help us. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give us new birth, cleanse us from sin, and raise us to eternal life. Now, everybody, raise your hands as if you are reaching out to bless these young people. Family and parents, put your hands on your child, on your confirmad, and bless them. Have the Spirit flow through you, all of you. This community of faith now blesses these confirmads. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Allie the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm her faith, guide her life, empower her in her serving, give her patience in suffering, and bring her to everlasting life. Amen. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Lucy the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm her faith, Guide her life, empower her in her serving, give her patience and suffering, and bring her to everlasting life. Amen. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Taruni the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm her faith, guide her life, empower her in her serving, give her patience and suffering, and bring her to everlasting life. Amen. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Tegan the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm her faith, guide her life, empower her in her serving, give her patience and suffering, and bring her to everlasting life. Amen. Let us rejoice now with these sisters in Christ. We rejoice with you in the life of baptism, and together we will give thanks and praise to God and proclaim the good news to all the world. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> what a joy to share in this moment together with you all. Friends of peace, pray with me. Lord, we come to you with the needs of the world, with the needs of our nation, with the needs of the church, with the needs of our community, and the needs of individuals. Lord, we pray that as a globe, we can find peace and unity in battling this pandemic together, that we assist one another and uplift one another and support one another. Lord, as a church, we look back to Luther's Reformation over 500 years ago, and that we don't lose sight of reform and reassessment and imagination and innovation about what the church is for and how the church best serves God and serves the world. Lord, we ask that our nation find unity as we head into an election unlike any that we've seen before. 
And rather than letting it divide us, help us to build bridges and find unity in our hope together to build a better world for us and our neighbor. Lord, we pray for Prince of Peace. We pray as we are unable to sit in this sanctuary together, that we feel the warmth of one another in our hearts and the spirit of you among us. And Lord, we pray for all of those who are in need, knowing that this pandemic makes things much harder, harder for loneliness, harder for mental health, harder for illness, harder to just be. Lord, we know that nothing can separate us, but please remind us of that by being present with us every day. In your name we pray, amen. Prince of Peace, we are so grateful for the offerings that you share with us. Offerings of your time, offerings of your talents, and of your treasures. Those offerings make it possible for us to be running ministries, including the ministry of our confirmants. In honor of that, we would like to offer back to you a video of some of the highlights of this year's class of confirmation. Please enjoy. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom come, come. your will be done, on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us today. A few announcements to share with you. Each Sunday morning, we gather on Zoom at 9.30 for a time of coffee, cookies, and conversation. At 10 a.m., we then move into our adult forum. Today, our affordable housing team will be leading a conversation and discussion on what they are learning about the needs of our neighbors and how this church might deepen our relationship as a result. Next Sunday, on November the 1st, Pastor Ruth will be our forum presenter as she offers some counsel for our anxious hearts as this community faces the elections taking place on November 3rd and the challenges of this ongoing pandemic. This coming Wednesday, October the 28th, we continue our annual tradition of hosting a spooky music organ concert and a program for all ages. This year, we'll be hosting a viewing party for the premiere of our program at 6 p.m. on Zoom. We hope you'll come in costume and enjoy seeing our special guests and featured performers. Speaking of music, we're hosting a special All Saints Day hymn sing and remembrance service with candles and communion. We'll be in the parking lot on Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. on November 1st. Just like our Park and Pray Wednesdays, you can stay in your cars or sit in camp chairs. Make your hymn suggestions in advance on our website. You can find more information about all of these happenings on our website and with the links found in our emails and in the description for this video on our YouTube channel. Now, receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. 
the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve, Serve the, Lord. the Lord. Thanks be to God.